Okay, so I want to say good afternoon to everyone and um, getting ready for our uh, our uh, quarterly or excuse me, our monthly lunch and learn. And um, we've got Cindy and Sue. They're both master guard, excuse me, master naturalists out of Bond County, Illinois. And they are going to speak today on bluebirds and a bluebird trail that they've been monitoring. They'll give us lots of information on the bluebirds habitat, how to set up your own trail and how they got involved. So um, I see Larry's on, so you won't miss anything, Larry. We're glad to have you back. And I will get off the horn and let you guys um, share some more information about yourself and your presentation. Well, we're, we're happy you're here today. And um, I am Cindy Adkins, and my friend here is Sue McCaslin. Pleased to meet you. And we are part of the Master Naturalist program. And uh, our experience with bluebirds kind of goes back to our beginning of the Master Naturalist program. We were kind of looking for uh, a group to be involved with and a way to kind of volunteer our time. So it, this uh, took place in the spring of 2020. Uh, we knew that we had a group um, with the North American Bluebird Society that was active in Greenville. And we thought that would be a, a great connection to the master naturalist. So in the spring of 2020, we met, we did several things actually. Um, we uh, first, uh, signed up for a membership with uh, the Bluebird uh, Journal or magazine, uh, which is part of the North American Bluebird Society. And we'll talk about that resource in a few minutes. Uh, but before we get there, I wanted to kind of give a background about how we started. Uh, the North American Bluebird Society uh, is a very active one. In 2018, we had, um, they, we have information from 2018 when the group was still active and before COVID, um, the number of houses and the number of bluebirds fledged, the number of houses that were monitored in Bond County were 99 and the number of bluebirds fledged was over 700. So it was a very successful group. And our goal is to kind of work with representatives from that group the leader of it, uh, Dr. Wilson was with Greenville College, is currently in a long care term facility. And so um, we, we'd like to see that, that group remain active and continue their work with Bluebirds. So um, we have uh, a list of the previous members and that were in the process of updating. And we've had conversations with uh, one of the Illinois affiliates. There are five Illinois affiliates to the Journal of the North American Bluebird Association. And the one that's in Paris, Illinois uh, is active. And so we've been, you know, communicating with that group. And our goal is to go over and see that group at some point so we can get a better idea of what's happening at the different affiliates. So today, what we'd like to do is talk a little bit about how we became interested in it. Um, we'd like to talk about some of the helpful resources that we're using. And then Sue will be going into Bluebird Basics, a little bit about you know, caring for the nest, and a little bit about boxes as well. So I'm not sure how experienced people uh, are you know, that are online and listening now, but We'll cover the basics and then maybe at the end, save time for a little bit of question and answer. Um, so I would like to tell you about the genus species name for the bluebird. It is Cialia cialis. And I was really interested in this because Sue and I both have a background in teaching and my subject was science. And Sue and I did a uh, butterfly garden what when we taught and so the genus species name to any living thing is kind of interesting to me if you follow the history on it uh so a gentleman by the name of carolus linnaeus was the first to um ascribe a genus species name to living things and actually if you translate that from latin into english it just means kind of bird but i think it's 
it's fun to know that, you know, that was in the 1700s. So uh, we've come a long way now. And uh, I just thought, you know, his effort in classifying all these animals in the 1700s, it's quite impressive. So uh, helpful resources. I held the Journal of North American Bluebird Society up, and I'm hoping you can kind of see that. They send out four of these journals per year at a cost of $25 for an individual membership. So the goal of the North American Bluebird Society is primarily education, conservation, and research. And all of those three things, I just, you know, I feel like they're a real priority with birds. Um, the, the material in it is, is excellent. It's very professional. A lot of people talking about their own bluebird experiences, the trails they've set up, the research that's going on. So it's, it's definitely um, designed for um, adults that are interested in learning more about bluebirds. It's, it's beautifully illustrated. So there are a lot of color pictures. And if you just enjoy reading about bluebirds, you'll really love that journal. So I, I really would recommend that. Um, I have another resource, of course, online. There are a ton of things that you can go to. Uh, Cornell University is excellent. The Audubon Society is excellent. Um, I think a couple of things that drew me to that Audubon Society website is that you can kind of play around with uh, the climate change issue. And so you can kind of determine like, you know, how many degrees the climate is going to change and then based on that, what happens to the population of bluebirds? So I thought that was kind of fun to do. And I think actually youth, you know, maybe um, upper elementary to junior high to high school would kind of get into that as well. So I, I would recommend the Audubon Society. Uh, the last one I wanted to show you, I think if we're going to make a difference with the population of bluebirds, we have to think about children. And so this book, uh, it's entitled Bluebirds by an author by the name of Stan Tekiela. And he is a naturalist and a wildlife photographer who has written many, many books. But what I like about this book are the beautiful color illustrations. Um, he just does an excellent job. It's a relatively quick read. I think there's 48 pages in the book. And it's certainly something that upper elementary to junior high, uh, you could use this in a science club, a science class, uh, just a you know, speaking engagement with kids. It's an excellent book and a great place to start. So uh, I think um, those are the two categories that I wanted to bring up today. And uh, so I'm gonna turn this over to Sue, but at the very end, I'd like you to kind of think of questions you, you have for us and let's save some question time at the very end. I'd like to do that. And I'm gonna turn it over to Sue. You don't have to move. Okay. 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 Um, the first question I'm going to say is, why do we do this? And I think Cindy kind of hit the nail on the head. She took my information when she quoted the statistics from just Bond County because of the 99 birdhouses that were put up, what was the figure that pledged? Almost 800. Almost 800 birds, and that is just phenomenal. At one point, the bluebirds were as common as the robin, but that is not so today. Um, there's the, the competition for habitat is extremely difficult. Um, there's many predators and bluebirds are just pretty defenseless. Um, at one point, there were 20 different species on the endangered list and bluebirds were number seven. Now that is not true today. The numbers are much better than what they had been 20 or 30 years ago. Um, in 1970, 
there was a 92% reduction in bluebirds, and that's pretty, uh, pretty critical. Why the reductions? First off, extreme loss of habitat due to big farming. And along with that loss of habitat, um, loss of food supply because pesticides are used to kill insects. Bluebirds live on insects. So if the food's not there, they're not gonna make it. Um, a lot of competition for the natural habitat that's left because bluebirds naturally are cavity dwellers. And that means they don't make their own cavity. They find a cavity that had been inhabited by mostly woodpeckers. And sometimes there's already been a nest in that cavity. So they build their nest on top of that one. And the problem with that is the fledglings are close to the opening and, and both the whole nest is close to the opening and it makes it easy for predators to reach in and um, destroy the nest. Um, they compete with starlings and house sparrows. Those are the, the most two birds that they compete against. They don't like trees in the middle of the timber. So you can have 20 dead trees in the middle of the timber and they probably won't choose it. The reason why it's too close to predators. They like their trees on the edge. Um, and like I said, this further limits the possibilities of natural uh, places that they can choose to nest. Um, solutions for this problem is providing nest boxes and the nest boxes have been really uh, successful in increasing the number. Um, they provide protection from predators by their size of the entrance hole. It's usually it's oval and um, a one and a half inch diameter across the center. And with our group of 10, um, the houses were already provided for us. And they're all what's called the Peterson type. And I'm sorry, I do not have an illustration to show you, but if you Google bluebird houses, you can see a various number of different styles. Um, uh, the, it, it's easy access for the bluebirds to enter. The base should be a five inch square. The, top needs to be slanted and you want to make sure that it opens easily because each week we go open these boxes and check to see number of eggs, kind of eggs, kind of nest, number of, of hatchlings, number of fledglings so that we know um, exactly what's going on. And when you take one of these nest, nest boxes, you need to face it toward the east, maybe slightly northeast, no perch, because that would give the opportunity for a predator to perch and reach in and, and bring out the baby birds. It should be made out of lumber that's three fourths to one inch thick. Uh, do not use plywood, do not use treated lumber because of the chemicals involved. You can paint it if you like, but it should be painted in earth colors. Uh, we had thought about painting ours just so that as we did our 10, box check, we didn't end up missing some. We wanted them to stand out for us. Well, that didn't work. It doesn't work that way for the birds. They know they're there, so we just have to tough it. <laughs> they need to be mounted with on a fence post or a PVC pipe, and they need to be mounted solid. They do not like to sway in the wind. Golf courses and cemeteries are an excellent place to put these boxes. Number one reason that um, it's maintained. The yards are mowed, the grass doesn't get very high. So that's a protection against predators. Um, there should be a small tree or a shrub fairly within a hundred feet maybe of the box. That pro provides a place where the fledglings can get as they come out of the nest for protection. Um, 
for predator control, you might have to put a baffle on the pole that holds up the house. A baffle is um, something that would prevent predators from climbing the pole. Um, it could be a PVC pipe. Um, it could be, um, looks like a cone that's mm -hmm. turned upside down. It's made mm -hmm. out of sheet metal and they can't climb over it. Um, it will stop uh, snakes, mm -hmm. uh, raccoons from entering the nest. Now, uh, I said that word snakes. Uh, each week we open our boxes and I reach in, but I'm very cautious when I reach in because snakes will devastate a nest. Um, where we are on the golf course, there's lots of people that frequent that golf course and the grass is mowed. So I don't think the threat of a snake is as high there as what it would be in some other cases, but you really have to be aware of reaching in there and make sure that you're not reaching into a snake. The placement of boxes can be in what they call a series. And um, the more the pop, higher the population of the bluebirds, the further the boxes need to be in that series. Now we're, we're on the golf course, we have around the perimeter, pretty much around the perimeter of the golf course, 10 boxes. I think mm -hmm. probably what we have would be qualified for a series. The food the bluebird eats is insects, berries, and wild fruit. Uh, in your backyard, if you wanna provide something for them, you can provide mealy worms. You can provide the mealy worms alive, or you can, um, it's best to soak them if you get the dried ones because it's easier for the uh, young ones to digest. It may take a while for them to find the boxes. It may take a while to find out, to find any food supply you put out, but don't be discouraged, they'll get there. Um, each year we've started um, the first month or so, we think this is gonna be a terrible year because we just don't have any. And then by the middle of the year, mm -hmm. we're starting to fill up. Mm -hmm. But while I'm on the subject, I will say that last year, the statistics were way down on um, the amount of bluebirds that came back to nest. Our statistics were down. Did you, mm -hmm. do we have those statistics? No. Um, I'm thinking that when we went to check our boxes, we were finding like one inhabited box out of the 10 e each week we went. And then toward the end of the year, it uh, kind of came back again. But the winter in Wisconsin and some of the northern states was extremely harsh. Mm -hmm. And that's I think that's what they're attributing, the reduction in number. But this year seems to be fairly good mm -hmm. so far. Mm -hmm. um, we monitor the boxes at least once a week. Sometimes research says do twice, but neither Cindy or I have the time to do a two times a week check. So we stick with the one time a week. Uh, we do teamwork when we do this. She is there with her recording paper. Would you try to show that, please? I will. Here's what here it is. Okay. So this would be for the current summer. Uh, now, are are you guys able to see that, Gail? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. We don't can't oh, read all okay. the words necessarily, but we definitely can. See, yeah. Very well. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, it allows pretty detailed information. Do you want, or do you have more you need to say? And then I'll go to that. Or... No, go ahead and talk about that okay. if you want to. Okay. Is that a so, sheet you made or is that a sheet that was supplied to you by the Bluebird Society? Actually, this came from the Bond County Bluebird okay. Society. And it's what they had been like disseminating to, neighbor, uh, to members. Gotcha. So we just, you know, continued on with that format. And I really like it. So basically, it's um, dates across the top and numbers of boxes down the uh, side, but it allows us to put if we have a, if if the box is empty, we record that. Uh, if we have a nest, we just use the letter N. If we have uh, eggs, we put the number, 
And if it's not the bluebird, if it's a wren or um, tree swallow, we, we keep that information. Um, if they're uh, hatchlings or fledglings, we put that information in each box and then total it at the end of the season. So, you know, as Sue said, sometimes we're looking at um, two different batches. What's my word? Hatch. Um, nest, nest, two, two different nests. Yes, or, and sometimes three. Sometimes they will have three. Or four. Or four, right. So it's handy and it's, it's very useful for comparing just, you know, uh, the same boxes every season, but also uh, making some comparisons, you know, between groups. Also, we can go over the statistics on this paper and mm -hmm. we can look at how productive each box has right. been. Right. And right now this season, we think that we have three boxes we need to move mm -hmm. because they're not, the birds don't choose them. Right. And the birds are picky. So if we don't get everything right, they're not going to do it. Um, so anyway, we do teamwork when we do this. Um, and she has the paperwork there and she does the recording. Our boxes um, are locked to open with a nail. We just slide a nail in a little hole and that locks them so they can't come open. So I always wear a rubber glove because birds do carry some diseases. And I put my left hand up in front of the box. I pull the nail and I hand it to Cindy. We got this down pat. <laughs> and then I open, carefully open it. I need to backtrack some. When we first come up to the box, we knock on it and we speak to the birds. Hello, are you in there? So that, you know, we don't really startle them when we open the door. So I put my hand up like this to guard against um, possibly a fledgling immaturely leaving the nest mm. I reach up and I open the door and cover that and then we want to know what we've got I reach into the nest carefully uh, but I don't think I have to worry so much about the snakes being in there but I reach in and I feel for eggs um, I bring one egg out and we look at it we determine is that a bluebird egg if it is I put it back and I count how many's in there. Sometimes I can see by tilting it a little bit and standing on my tiptoes. Sometimes I just have to depend on a finger count. Then close the box up and away we go. Now, if it is not a bluebird egg, we have to destroy the nest. Uh, except that if it's a chickadee or um, some swallows, we were letting the wrens go, but I've been reading lately that we're supposed to take them out too. Um, so we, in the first part of the year, we are inundated with sparrow nests. So it's kind of disheartening to go out there and throw mm -hmm. away a nest, throw away a nest, throw away a nest, but that's what we do. And then after we get them discouraged, then the bluebirds come. Okay, so that would be week one. And the next week, we count the eggs again. Have we lost any? Are they all gone? Uh, and that type thing. Are they then, on the ground? Are, yeah, we look to see, are they on the ground? Are pieces on the ground? Right. Uh, and then eventually, when I open it up, there will be hatchlings in there. So I try to count the hatchlings um, without disturbing them too much. And then we continue counting hatchlings until we get fledglings. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, hopefully the the box hasn't been tampered with. And by the end of the, of the cycle, we, we can, I can count um, fledglings. And if then we come back the next week, they're gone. We don't see any evidence of anything else. We count that as a success. So um, at this point, I think we would open it up to any possible questions um, and go from there. All right. Does anyone have any questions um, for our bluebird folks? Yeah, I have. This is Larry. Uh, how far apart do, do those boxes need to be? Well, it says 125 to 150. Mm -hmm. Then if your population, if you have a 
your population is increasing, you notice that, you can always move them further apart. That way it gives more area for food. That's that's feet, is that feet or yards? Yards. Yards, yards. okay. Yes. Yeah. No, yards. Well, okay. okay. I'm glad you corrected yeah. that. Well, what's the biggest predator of bluebirds? Do you know? What's that? The biggest predator. Raccoons. Raccoons, Raccoons and snakes. Okay. okay. Yes. And cats, you know, if they're like on properties that have cats. Yeah. I, I, I have bluebirds and so, sometimes they're here in the spring and sometimes they don't nest. You, what you're telling me that they might uh, they might occupy a nest like midsummer? Right. Okay. Be, I think the, the key to remember is be patient. All right. If you're, if you're patient <laughs> and diligent, you may be rewarded. Yeah. <laughs> you just never know. And about the time you get discouraged and you think you'll never get them, you That's go back you, and you've got a nest. I, I think I forgot to mention that most research says that when the bluebirds leave the nest, you should take that nest out and sweep out your box and make sure it's clean. If the nest is still in really good shape, sometimes we do not take it out. But if it looks like it's um, had some wear and tear, excuse me, then we would take it out and clean the box. So. And you can sure tell the difference between a sparrow and a bluebird's nest. Yeah, I can, yeah. You know, they're uh, just a mess, the sparrow. Are, are ants a problem? Can they be a problem? Or I've read that, uh, uh, that they will kill young bluebirds. Did, did you say ants? Ants, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh my, we've, we've never, never, we've never seen ants in our boxes. Well, we, I don't oh. think we've had any insects. Right, but oh. we're on a golf course. Yeah. So we're not actually, you know, sure about the effect of uh, pesticides, you know, on uh, on our bluebirds. Yeah. But we still seem to have them. So, so I, I hear more resilient than we think. I, I, I hear you, you're standing, you're those. standing up and peeking in. How how is there a height that is recommended for those bluebirds? A height. Yes, there is. What's that? A height. Five, five feet. Five, five to six feet, right? Yeah. Five to six feet. Okay. So Larry, I don't know if these guys ever do this, but I know when I've taken kids on a bluebird trail, not monitoring officially, if you will, we've taken a dental mirror. Right. To, to, and you can poke that in the hole. Well, you will see in. pictures of that, Gail, uh, about people using like a mirror on a stick. Mm -hmm. you know, to check, to, to check progress. But really Sue and I just, you know, we're very, very careful when we open that door and, you know, we'll even put our hands around the opening because we don't want to lose them. Right. Uh, but we, we are careful to get an accurate count. Because right. I was very surprised that you used your hands so much because, you know, we're, we're all kind of raised with that don't touch because of the your human scent and the mother mother right. come back. Right. So so the um the one thing that um I'll be honest with you, I've opened a lot of bluebird boxes in, in my life and I've never put my hand over the door like the window, the excuse okay. me, the opening. And I find that absolutely um amazing that I didn't know that up until today. And I well. can I think that's perfect because I can see we're a one a bird that's not ready to fledge and fledges and then you're kind of stuck. So oh, I love hearing that be, today. That was new information uh, for me. You know, I think I think Gail, we would be sick if we lost a fledgling. You yes. know, um, we just really careful about the population. But so far, we've we've not opened it and ended up regretting it. So if the you other put thing your hand I up there. You yeah, I love that. I will do that from this day forward. So that they they can't get out. Yeah, I'll do and that from this day forward. If you use a mirror, forward. I don't know that you'd get an right. accurate count. Because right. sometimes, um, even with the fledglings, I have to like count by finger with, you know, by handling them. I mm -hmm. can't always see that there's three, four, five, because they're tucked so close together. Hmm. So I've had two broods a year. You guys are caught, you know, however, whatever terminology you want to use. 
but I'd be really uh, impressed if I got three or four in our area. Right. That, that right. sounds wonderful. Um, well, the uh, Gail, this is just a little bit of trivia. The bluebird is the state bird of two states. Does anybody know what two states oh, that I would love be? That. Anybody online that want to guess? I, I'll guess, but I, I want somebody else to try first. Larry? I do not know. Is Missouri one of them? Yes, it is. Good job. Missouri and New York. Oh, New York. I would have never guessed New York. Okay. See, you can tell she was a teacher, guys. Look how wonderful she's got it. She's, she's <laughs> well, got it. Okay, and I got another one, a little piece of trivia All right. about their ability to eat a monarch but butterfly. They can actually squeeze the poison uh, from inside the butterfly out before they eat it, and they're not affected by the poison. Wow. I, I thought that I was could, an interesting little bit of trivia. I wish I could eat like that. Just squeeze the calories out. <laughs> Can That's we funny. adapt and adopt that plan? Chris, you lit up. Did you have a question? Yeah. When you were cleaning out, you said you you took the you were leaving the wren nest or the chickadee nest. Do you do you have to remove all your like all the nest out of there? Will they use it after that? Or have you seen that that might be an issue? Do so they mean, just go into well, it like whenever you have the when you leave the the other ones in there do you seem to have any trouble with the the bluebirds coming in after they've had a another person's nest in there or do you just clean it out and move on i didn't know if they you know were sensitive to that or not i i think it's very random you know i think just when you get discouraged and think you will not have a bluebird take that box they take that box so, you know, we, we try to keep them available for the bluebird, uh, but um, the, the, the wren, if you're familiar with the wren's nest, they're just uh, un, unfriendly, the nest. <laughs> like a hoarder? Yeah. Right, right. Like a hoarder. <laughs> on, on your three boxes, do you think it's just the placement of them or if there was like a, a smaller shrub next to it do you, uh, with a food source, do you think that they might go to those a little more readily or well, do you think it's just a habitat of where they happen to be? The traffic is going through that area and disturbing them more. See, it's our third season. So I, I think it's easy when you're doing a trail, you kind of get locked into numbers. And you don't step back and think, well, wait a minute, this box has not been successful. What could it be? Yeah. And, and that's kind of, this is our third season of doing it. And I think that's where we're at finally. You know, it's, it's hard to say what the variables are. You don't know. Is it that there is no bush nearby? Is it a matter of too much traffic? It, it's just hard to say. I think all you can do is play a little, you know, like maybe move it and, but then you have to be patient and give it time in that new spot. Yeah. It's, so, it's I have a question. <clears throat> so I have a question you may or may not be able to answer, but because you get the Bluebird Society magazine, perhaps you have more information than myself. Several years ago, very cold winter, lots of bluebirds went into their houses as multiples just to stay warm. Right. You know, five, six, seven, eight, whatever birds in one house just to stay warm and protect themselves. Right. And when folks like yourself went to monitor their nest in the spring and clean them out, they found all these dead birds. Yeah. Have they ever discussed and, uh, and said why they didn't just go south, why they stayed there, why they got stuck in that position and trapped in those houses? And that I don't know, Gail. Her yeah. question was... Um, do you remember what year that was? Gail? I think it was two years ago. Because you know, I would, I kind of lost track of years when I say two years ago. So it may have been three, but it okay. was within, it was in with the last five years for sure, but probably uh, two to three. Okay. Okay. A bunch of them were freezing in boxes. Mm -hmm. Well, um, the year in nest, we probably would leave that in and clean it out in the spring yeah. just to add a little bit of warmth in case they were here for the winter and were in the house. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it's still a question. Was, was never... that what you were wondering about, Gail? Or did, were well, you what asking... happened is say we were gonna have, a, we were having this extreme cold spell 
and like say yeah. 10 or 15 bluebirds would all go into that house and and huddle together for warmth and they ended up freezing to death and dying right. and right. it wasn't discovered until people went in in the spring to clean out their houses right. right and they found them and i just wondered if anybody ever determined what caused that because you right. know bird has wings all they got to do is fly you know an hour south and they're protected right. but why they got stuck in that situation so right so i don't know gail if we did some research on that and and i could try that well, i'm sure we could find some kind of explanation about it I would but the truth somebody. is there are so many natural uh barriers i guess to successful <laughs> successful bluebird birth mm -hmm. you know um but i don't i will check and see if yeah. i can find something well, on you, that I would say if you're with some of your specialists or you travel to the other group, I, I'd be interested in getting right. into to that. Right. So I'll I see what I can find out. Larry, I see you're still unmuted. Do you have any additional questions you'd like to ask? Or Kathy, um, I haven't even um, said anything to you, but if you have a question, this is a good opportunity to, because we'll be sharing this information via our, our recording. So if you've got questions, yeah. other people will be interested in hearing the answers. I'm like you. I remember a few years ago that they huddled in in uh, boxes, and I think the raccoons or something, because I had feathers all over the ground. What really made me uh, observe that in the spring? Wow. So, yeah. Uh, That's interesting. Yeah. Okay. So something that you guys have done today that uh, it really impresses me, and I know it's your background, it's teaching and science, is um, the whole aspect of the observation. And then collecting your data and then drawing right. the conclusions. And even when you did the observation in regards to once you had those boxes for three years and others were being used in the vicinity, but not your those, um, that makes a really good naturalist, really good scientist. We were going to discuss that a little bit tonight, but observation is, you know, stopping, slowing down, checking out, like Chris mentioned, traffic. You know all those things that can affect that right. to maybe make a decision yeah. and i just want to point that out how important that that observation and drawing that conclusion and very right. uh, impressed that you guys have shared that information with us on that level i do have a quick question great kathy um have you ever had the fledglings fall out of a house and if so what did you do with them I don't think we have. Ever. We have not had a fledgling fall out, but we are extremely careful. <laughs> okay. But, you know, that would be like our worst nightmare. Um, it, but I mean, if they did, I, I think we would both just very, very gently try to get that gathered back in our hands and get it back in the box. Okay. Just we have not of... had a problem with that. We've had okay. some eggs fall out for sure because, uh, the way the nest was built, it wasn't built toward the back of the house. And then when you open it up, it, there's a space there mm. and they would, they fell out of that space. So we have to be careful there, but that's, I think maybe that nest was on its second time around. Okay. And it probably should have been taken out and destroyed okay. and a new one put in there. Do so they fly? when they're do they fly out when they're younger have you ever seen that or do they fall to the ground and hop away we have not seen okay. a fledgling uh leave the next we, we've never seen that event it when we go back you know like the next week let's say week uh three well they're they're in it takes a little over two weeks It'd be another week, right? Uh, it'd be the beginning of the fifth week that they would yeah. fledge. Okay. Between hatch, uh, you know, when the incubation and yes. and the hatch. Yeah. Okay. So, so we've never seen that event. I'd love to see that though. Okay. I have a friend that had a camera in a box that she was watching and she got to see them fly and she said they flew very well. Okay. So they flew out. See, we had yes. a couple of years ago we had some fledglings on the ground oh, okay and we tried to put them back and they came back out of the house so and they stayed on the ground so we weren't quite sure what to do and right. if that was a common experience but right apparently well, not. That, that's why they say it's so important to have the nest 
near a place that will provide cover for the fledgling. Right. Okay. So, you know, I guess within hopping distance. <laughs> mm -hmm. okay. well, I think the biggest mistake uh, made, and it's published in lots and lots of uh, places, especially in the spring, is do not pick up a fledgling if it got there naturally, not be based on you opening a door. But right. fledglings, especially like robins, they will live on the ground three, four days, and the mother will continue to maintain to and take them. care of them. So right. I would probably, if it came, if it happened naturally, I probably would not pick them up and not try to put them in the nest. That's just right. A, right. A and the only and reason we did is because at the time we had an outdoor cat. Oh, oh yeah. sure. So it was either or. What do we do? Right. But we did wear, you know, gloves so we sure. could mask our human scent as much right. as possible. Yeah. So the Peterson plan, it's a little bit more complicated of a box to build because there are some angles. On the master's update, uh, when I uh, did the full promotion for today, I did have a link in there for the Peterson box. Okay. So if anybody wants plans, I will uh, pull together uh, some of the resources they said. And when I send out the link to this, I'll send those um, other items that you, you mentioned today. Okay. I'll tell you what, the, the last thing, and then let anybody else finish up with questions. You guys are really... Um, gotten to be very experienced at this the hardest part for me and I don't know if this will be for others is when I do come up on a nest and another species of bird that's not desirable is in the nest but the and maybe because you do it on a weekly frequency this won't happen but the birds are already there the sparrows or the are alive and hatched and people kill them then when they remove the nest they also kill those birds have you ever had to experience removing a nest that had live birds in it that were the wrong species no we've 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 done right. eggs yeah it's hard we, we it? have it? we have taken the nest out with eggs in it right yeah. yes yes but, never had uh, but, but as far as the baby birds i i don't that's kind of where i draw the line i can't I do that I well know. you know that bothers me too gail uh and and if you do some reading on that, you you will see people saying, you know, they trap them or whatever. Oh, yeah. I that that bothers me too. I um, just wondered because that to me is a hard hard for me. Even if it's an invasive sparrow, you know, and it's right. an unwanted species, it's easier to pull a honeysuckle than it is to kill a bird. <laughs> right. Well, you know what, Gail? I guess. That's another reason for check monitoring every week, right? Because you catch it before they're baby birds. Yeah, which is one. You know, you're gonna you're gonna see your eggs. You're gonna notice the difference in color and size, and you can dispose of them relatively kindly. Yeah. Well, you guys have made some excellent points. We uh, but, got you know, time some to keep in mind. We've got time. If there's anyone else here who has any questions. We will definitely make this a topic uh, at a meeting, maybe pick out some locations and see if we can get some folks to set up a trail. Uh, That'd be awesome. We'll use you guys as expertise because this has been an amazing conversation. Any other questions? Well, Gail, we just wanna say thank you for providing the opportunity and for you guys showing up today, we appreciate it. Um, and you know, it's, it's been three years and I feel like we've learned a lot and it's been very enjoyable. Um, and, and one thing about, you know, um, I, I think we, we always go on Monday morning, usually about eight 30, maybe nine and we're together, which kind of helps with the discipline portion of it. You know, I would say pick a day, pick a time with a friend and uh, you're more likely to do that on a weekly basis. Oh, okay. Well, I am now going to rename you both as Bond County Ambassadors for the Bluebird. <laughs> and um, I do know the gentleman who they were talking about who's in, in, in a facility, a, a nursing facility, and he's amazing and dedicated to this. He spoke to us a long time ago on Bluebirds. Um, He's so the legacy that you're you're carrying on for him and trying to build on that is amazing. So we want to thank you for that. Well, he left us some big shoes to fill. Yes, exactly. Did. Yeah, he was. Uh, I felt so bad. He was at Carlisle Lake and he had brought his scope. 
and he was starting to have some some issues and memory issues and he he either left it either just he lost it somehow he didn't take it with them and that made it was a very stressful time for him because he was trying to relocate it and someone sure. picked it up after we left but oh, okay so i just unfortunately that's my last memory of how distressed he was about that but he okay. was quite, quite the guy well he was a he is a wealth of information mm -hmm. well you guys are wonderful um ambassadors and we thank you and the um anyone else last chance because we're gonna say goodbye otherwise and thank these um folks uh cindy and sue for this amazing presentation, something we haven't really covered too much. So we really appreciate it. Thank you for all your hard work at doing this citizen scientist project too, collecting all the data. We really appreciate that. It's been enjoyable. It's it, a fun it thing to do. It is. Thank yeah, you. That's a very good point, Chris. They don't just put these in a shoebox on the shelf. They This is shared with the organization. So they use this data too. So that's a great point that you brought up. All right, guys. Well, thank you again. Enjoy the rest yeah. of the day. It was Monday. Did you monitor this morning or maybe not because of the talk? Uh, when did we go? What's that? When did we go this week? Monday or Sunday? We went Sunday. We went Sunday. went Sunday. Well, yeah, it was a little exception to the rule. We had to do it Sunday night because we couldn't do it Monday. Right. Got I it. was out of town. <laughs> oh, OK. Well, thank you again. You're welcome. All right. Well, again, enjoy the rest of the day. Oh, go, Larry. Larry, my yeah. Goodbye. Home. Just go say bye. Thanks. Thank you, oh, Larry. It was welcome. really great to thank have you, you online. Coming. Yes. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Kathy. All right, guys. Thank you. All right. Bye bye. Take bye -bye. care. Bye. -bye. bye.